So um, Simon gave me this very interesting question to explore with you this morning. Um, and he also, not knowing that I'm not a morning person, gave me the worst absolute slot of the day. Um, however, I think those two things might actually cancel each other out, because uh, answering this question at this ungodly hour of the day might actually prove interesting enough um, that, it will, that it will serve to, to bear the responsibility, if you were, of being the, the kickoff talk of the day. Um, because exploring this question will allow me to explore the larger question of why is cloud computing interesting? Why is it of any use at all? Why would an enterprise want to understand it, use it, or do anything with or about it at all? Um, because only if those questions have sensible answers uh, does it even make sense to ask the question of whether or not the enterprise is ready for it. Um, and so in the process of doing that, I think we'll have an interesting talk. So let's cut straight to the chase. Let's answer the question. Do I think the enterprise is ready for the cloud? No, absolutely not. Not even close. But I'm also going to assert throughout the next 20 minutes that I don't think this matters at all. I think it's completely irrelevant. Um, and in order to do that, I'm going to have to spend a few minutes not talking about cloud computing at all, but talking about business. And I'm going to start with an anecdote that Simon sometimes tells if you give him a few beers. He talks about how he used to have a software company that sold a SaaS service to another company. This was a kind of a sales support application. And he'd sold it to this other company in a kind of an operating expenditures model to the extreme. It was a revenue sharing deal where each sales lead that his software generated for this new company generated some revenue for his company. So this, this customer company, they were only paying for things that actually made the money. And Simon was only earning money off of this thing if it made money for the customer. It was wildly successful for this company. They were making lots of money. It was generating all kinds of leads. And so they canceled it. And they canceled it because after having run it for some period of time, they discovered that their in-kernel accounting, bookkeeping, budgeting procedures could not accommodate this kind of ongoing operating costs. They couldn't pay the bills. They had to budget a year ahead of time. They had to make all kinds of estimates. They had to know in some period of time ahead of time or make guesses about what kind of money they were going to need to spend. And so they couldn't accommodate these kinds of ongoing operating costs. So they canceled this thing that was making the money. And Simon's company went out of business. They weren't ready. In a recent blog post that I quite liked by a young lady I've recently met on Twitter by the name of Shanley Kane. Shanley wrote, and I'll quote her, the point is that while the cloud generation and the as-a-service model, as, has theoretically enabled a new process and ramp for adoption, try a little pay as you go, scale up when you get ready, this is not matched by process innovations inside the enterprise. And she goes on to say this leads to conflict and antagonism. It leads to silos and all kinds of bad things. And she talks about this term she calls the rogue clouders within organizations that are doing cloud without any permission or any of these other things. Growl is cool. And when I read that, because I'm a really old person, what I immediately thought of was the client-server revolution of the 80s and the 90s. I'm older than I look. And I came of age in the client-server revolution of the 80s and the 90s. And we, I mean, we were convinced, we really thought, that we were going to kill the glass house. That was a name that we used to refer to the inflexible, centralized, high priests of the mainframe that controlled everything. We thought we were going to introduce the power of computing, the ability to compute yourself, to every branch office, every division, every project, every worker was going to get his own little chunk of compute power to innovate with. And this was all about money. This was about cash money. If you're too young to remember the client-server revolution, then you may not know the people that drive it were the sales guys. They wanted spreadsheets, because that made them money. The cycle time to deal with the high priests in the glass house was absurd. And they were able to make lots of money if they were able to run these little spreadsheets locally. All of that is very similar to the stuff that we talk about today with regard to the cloud. And it's also very similar to the kinds of stuff that we've encountered over the last 10 years or so with 
bringing open source technologies into the enterprise. All of these things have these kind of similarities, and we encounter the same difficulties, issues of control and governance versus the need to innovate and grow. This stuff, this, these similarities and these recurring patterns, this makes old people like me chuckle. It amuses us. When Shanley Kane writes this post, and she's very young, says, well, this is terrible. These people can't get along, and this is going to cause all these problems. This makes us laugh, because it confirms one of our most profound and hardest earned bits of wisdom as an old person. This has all happened before and will happen again. I was told not to use this joke um, because I was told that it's likely that if you haven't seen Battlestar Galactica, you won't know why that's funny. And I said, dude, I'm going to OSCON. I don't think that's going to be a problem. In any case, the reason why this has all happened before and will happen again has to do with these profound forces that work on large, complex, adaptive systems, of which the economy is one, and any enterprise is also. Simon's commoditization curve, of which this is a version, is one of the two forces that I'm going to talk about this morning that lead to the way these things happen. And the, Simon's already explained what it is. All you need to know is that my hypothesis here is that as things move from being innovation up to becoming commodities and then enabling the next wave of innovation, that's one of the two things I think is very interesting that causes these kinds of recurrent patterns and these rhythms of things. And the other one that I'm going to talk about, the other force that works together with Simon's commoditization curve is this formula. Risk equals likelihood of failure times the cost of failure. This particular version of this formula is often used in, when you're talking about information security. And the version of it that I cite here is from the Handbook of Information Security. But it's also in almost exactly the same form. It'll show up in almost any given MBA course nowadays. And the reason for that is because every business decision is a decision that's characterized by risk. So you need to understand risk. You need to assign it a probability. And you do that using a formula like this one. And I'm going to assert the following hypothesis, that over the last 50 years, since the 60s, enterprises have put too much emphasis on one variable in this formula at the expense of the rest. They have focused almost relentlessly on reducing the likelihood of failure rather than the cost of failure. And they've done that largely because they felt that the cost of failure was a fixed constant that they couldn't do much about. So the likelihood was a more promising lever. Almost any process, methodology in business that you can think about, whether it be an IT-focused one like ITIL or CMMI, or it's a purely more business-focused methodology like Six Sigma or PMI or any of these things, the ways that we propose, estimate, price, control, govern things is all about trying to reduce the likelihood of failure. Reducing the likelihood of failure ostensibly, theoretically, leads to two things, predictable outcomes and repeatable results. And it is the relentless focus on predictable outcomes and repeatable results that has characterized the efforts of business innovation over the last 50 years or so. When you turn your head and start to look at business processes in this manner, you'll see that, in fact, almost any business process you can talk about, accounting, bookkeeping, supply chain management, are characterized by this essential nature that they're trying to reduce the likelihood of failure. And they're assuming that the cost of failure is more or less a fixed constant that they can't do anything about. In fact, I'm going to go even further out on a limb. When economists talk about the value of IT since the 60s, the thing that they almost always talk about is that it has enhanced productivity. And I'm asserting that when they say productivity, what they're actually talking about is this reduction of the likelihood of failure. That Predictable outcomes and repeatable results have reduced the likelihood of failure and thus enabled us to do more things. So this means something very interesting, though. Simon talks about how, when you give him more time to talk about it, that certain methodologies and techniques are more appropriate at one spot on this curve than at, say, another spot on this curve. He'll tell you, for example, that something like Six Sigma is really good at managing commodities. But it sucks at managing innovation. It'll typically kill innovation stone cold dead. By the same token, things that are really good at the innovation side of the curve are really lousy at managing commodities in general. And this focus, I'm asserting, that, that the business world has had over the last 50 years on reducing the likelihood of failure has led them to be all in at one end of the curve. 
They placed all their bets here. Their focus is too much on commodities. And so they know that. They can perceive that. They talk about, we need more innovation. The innovators dilemma. Get Clayton Christensen in here. But they can't really figure out what to do about it. And this is why I'm asserting that it doesn't matter that the enterprise is not ready for the cloud. This is Clay Shirky. And in his wonderful book, Here Comes Everybody, he talks in chapter 10 about what drives and creates the open source means of production. And he uses that particular formula. And he talks about how reducing the likelihood of failure is what drives and creates the value of open source means of production. Agile methods as a reaction to the waterfall approach of software development. If you're into BPM, adaptive case management as a reaction to over-engineered business processes. Lean manufacturing techniques are all about an attempt to shift our focus towards the cost of failure and find ways to reduce cost of failure. Large systems, complex adaptive systems, seek a certain equilibrium. And what I'm asserting is that over the last 10 years or so, what we've been seeing emerging is the larger system on a whole trying to achieve a new equilibrium by emergent things that allow us to focus on reducing the cost of failure. This is really about opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is that which you give up for making a decision. In game theory, Clever players try to defer decisions for as long as they possibly can, because they're trying to gather more information to make the most informed possible decision. If you sink money into physical assets, sunk costs for IT assets, you've committed yourself to a particular decision that will reduce the number of paths that you can take in the future. If you focus relentlessly on reducing the likelihood of failure, if you think that predictable outcomes and repeatable results are possible, you will attempt to estimate probabilities fairly early on in a given cycle. The mere act of estimating those probabilities will force you to commit to certain things and reduce the number of choices you have to make. Paths simply vanish that might have otherwise been there. Reducing the cost of failure is a tactic that allows us to defer decisions for a longer period of time, make them later on, and to recover more quickly from decisions that we have already made. Fail fast, release early, release often. These are things about reducing the cost of failure. So if we could do that, if we could reduce the cost of failure, ideally, that would enable us to achieve a better balance between these two ends of the curve and to focus on both innovation and commodity. And my assertion is that cloud computing, its fundamental nature, its purpose, the answer to the why is that it allows you to reduce the cost of failure. In fact, if I wasn't at OSCON and I wasn't worried about open source geeks lynching me, I would assert it's the most important such thing to emerge in the last few years. Why do I think that? This is a very quick example. This is a picture of the allocation of and contention for test resources in a large enterprise in the banks and the insurance companies that I tend to work for. This could be mainframe environments, but the universal constant here is that it's a constrained resource. I have seen Fortune 500 enterprises where one project that failed to meet its presumed target date to use the integration test environment, hey, predictable outcome, yay, had a knock-on domino effect on all of the other projects waiting in line to use it after they were finished that cost hundreds of millions of dollars. And I mean at the upper end of hundreds of millions of dollars. Serious money. Cloud computing lets me do this. It lets me essentially throw an IT stack at every single one of those projects. It allows me to do that at such a cost that I can also now not only allow them to all work with one another without contention, but I can also now do things that otherwise would not have been possible in the past. The perennial question in any enterprise is, can we afford to experiment with this and see if it's going to bring us any value or not? And almost always the answer, if you have to deal with some kind of fixed asset cost, is nah. Get out of here. That doesn't need to be the answer anymore. And that, in turn, implies the potential that cloud computing brings with it. It allows me to 
change the value chain within an enterprise to go from brainstorming to market much faster than I ever could have before, to fail fast, to release early and often. That's the why of cloud computing. And it's also why it doesn't matter whether the enterprises figure it out or not. It doesn't matter whether they're ready or not. I think that what we are looking at as a consequence of cloud computing is the beginning of the next great age, not just of IT, but of business in general. If the age that we have been in to date has been one, as economists will tell us, that has been focused on raising productivity, I think the beginning of, we are at the beginning of the age where we focus on growth. I think productivity is a checked box. Done, been there, been there, done that, over. And as with any such great change, this is a picture of a trilobite. This was a dominant life form in a periods of Earth's history known as the Cambrian Explosion. But it's extinct now. It was once the big dog on the block, but it's gone. And it's gone because when its environment changed, it could not adapt. It wasn't ready. <laughs> there are going to be a lot of enterprises that say to me, this is not happening to me. They will deny what's happening to them, and they will say it's only a flesh wound. I can't predict the future. I don't have a crystal ball. And even if I did, you would be not well advised to listen to me. But I certainly know where my bets are placed with regard to cloud computing and whether or not the enterprise is ready for it. Thanks for your time.